the brass bell in coal in a discovery in 1944 that by now is almost becoming commonplace. A man called Newton Anderson found this quaint brass bell inside a lump of coal that was mined near his house in West Virginia Figure 42. Newton dropped the lump and it broke revealing the bell encased inside. The bell underwent rigorous testing and was extensively analyzed at the University of Oklahoma and found to contain known metals but mixed together in an unusual blend and quite different from any modern alloys. Numerous other such discoveries in coal have even been recorded including the delicate gold chain mentioned previously and cast iron pot that was also found inside a coal seam. The Rhodesian man in 1921 the Neanderthal skull was discovered 60 feet below ground in Rhodesia that produced a strange mystery. Upon examination it appeared that the skull had been pierced by a high-velocity projectile similar to a bullet in the left temple area figure 43. Tests have shown that the injury must have indeed occurred at the moment of death and not from a stray bullet years afterwards. This means that whoever fired the fatal bullet must have done it thousands of years ago. According to author, René Neuerbergen, the German forensic authority from Berlin has positively stated that the cranial damage to Rhodesian man's skull could not have been caused by anything but a bullet. The rounded entry point of the wound also testifies to the great speed at which the projectile would have had to have been traveling. A pillar of much too pure iron in Delhi, India There is an iron pillar that has completely defied metallurgists by remaining absolutely rust-free for the last 1600 years, ever since its discovery by the West Figure 45. It's unclear for how long the pillar has actually been standing for in fact there is more than one of these in India but the problem lies in the fact that such rust-free iron of the type that is found in these pillars is unheard of in our modern technology. These iron pillars are in fact a metallurgist nightmare or dream depending on your mindset but one truly interesting thing is the fact that the only other place completely rust-free iron has been located is in rock samples that were brought back from the moon during the Apollo missions. So where on earth did the iron used to make these pillars in India come from in ancient times? Some people have theories on where such pillars are from, save the thought. Two point eight billion year old metal spheres in a most bizarre series of finds that are still ongoing for the past sixty years or so. Miners in Africa have been finding literally hundreds of metal spheres some from quite deep underground. And at least one of them, possibly more, has three parallel groups running around its circumference figure 44. The spheres seem to come in two types. One is of a solid bluish metal and has white flecks in it and the others are hollow with a kind of spongy center. The curator of the Museum of Clerks Dorf in South Africa, where many of the spheres are housed, the Mr. Rolf Marx describes them this way. The spheres are a complete mystery. They look man-made, yet at the time in Earth history when they came to rest in this rock no intelligent life existed. They're nothing like I have ever seen before. Rolf Marx also wrote a further letter dated September 12, 1984 that contains more information on the spheres. In it he wrote, There is nothing scientific published about the globes, but the facts are. They are found in pirate fill life which is mined near the little town of Ottosdal in the western Transvaal. This pirate the light all to SI for O1002 is a quite soft secondary mineral with a count of only three on the most scale and was formed by sedimentation about 2.8 billion years ago. On the other hand the globes, which have a fibrous structure on the inside with a shell around it, are very hard and cannot be scratched, even by steel. The most scale of hardness was devised and is named after Friedrich Mohs, who chose 10 minerals as references points for comparative hardness, with talc the softest and diamond the hardest. However, as if the mere existence of these metal spheres is not enough there is still another amazing property of the artifacts that captured the attention of the Mr. John Hunt of Petersburg about 15 years ago. While playing with one of the objects on the flat surface of a table one day, Hunt apparently noticed that the sphere seemed to be particularly well balanced so he decided to take it to the California Space Institute at the University of California for testing to determine just exactly how well balanced it actually was. What the results of the tests surprisingly showed was that the sphere was in fact balanced perfectly and exactly. The balance of the sphere was in fact 
so exact, that it exceeded the limits of any of the Space Institute's current measuring technology, and these are the people who make gyro compasses for NASA. Not badly balanced at all, really. The sedimentary rock in which most of these spheres were found is located well below the surface in deep underground mines and is estimated to be a staggering 2.8 billion years old. The crystal skulls perhaps it's because they are fashioned in the shape of human skulls or maybe it's due to the hint of some dark and mysterious curves, whatever the reason may be. There are few artifacts that have generated more interest than the crystal skulls. There have actually been several crystal skulls of quite incredible workmanship found in various places around the world though perhaps the most widely celebrated and also the most mysterious of these is the Mitchell Hedges skull which has also been known as the Skull of Doom figures 46A and 46B. There are at least three very good reasons for this. Firstly, the skull is very similar in form and size to an actual human skull even featuring the faded and removable jawbone while most other known crystal skulls are of a more stylized or avant-garde appearance, quite often with unrealistic features and teeth that are simply etched onto the surface of the crystal. Secondly, it is as yet unknown how the Mitchell Hedges skull was constructed. From a scientific and technical perspective, it appears to be an utterly impossible object that has been made to a ridiculous degree of perfection by an unknown technique which today's most talented sculptors and engineers are still unable to duplicate, even by modern methods and quite simply should not exist. Thirdly, it is a complete mystery as to where the skull actually comes from. The discovery of the skull is still a controversial matter and one that has been brought into question many times. The story goes like this. The British explorer by the name of F. A. Michael Mitchell Hedges embarked on several expeditions with the aim of searching for evidence of the lost civilization of Atlantis. He claims that his stepdaughter Anna unearthed the skull in 1927 during such an expedition that he had led into the ancient Mayan ruins of Lubantu, in Belize then called British Honduras. According to Mitchell Hedges, Anna then 17 years old was searching inside a structure that was believed to have once been a temple, when she found the cranium of the crystal skull inside. At the time of the discovery, the skull was lacking its jawbone which was itself found three months later, about 25 feet away from where the cranium had been found. Mitchell Hedges says that he felt the object held some special significance and claims that he didn't want to take the skull away from the site where it had been found and had offered it to the local priests but that the Mayans had then given the skull back to him. As a gift upon his departure, a dubious tale at best. Michael Mitchell Hedges was born in 1882 and died in 1959. He was known by his friends as a charming rogue. At one stage of his career he was even known as the British Baron von Munchausen. He was an explorer, an author, a gambler and a soldier with Pancho Villa during the Mexican Revolution. He was undoubtedly a very colorful and quite roguish character. The rather impressive initials that he had next to his name actually resulted from him having joined the London Zoological Society and enabled him to enter the zoo on Sundays. Although I think that he may have actually founded the society to begin with. Many people found Mitchell Hedges' story to be questionable at the time and evidence now shows that his tale of the skull's discovery was probably entirely fabricated. There are no known photographs of the skull among those that were taken during any of his Lubatoon expeditions and there is no record of Mitchell Hedges ever displaying or even acknowledging any existence of the skull any time prior to 1943. It is also interesting that when he took the skull on a trip to South Africa in 1947, Mitchell Hedges himself made this cryptic remark about the skull. We took with us the sinister skull of doom of which much has been written. How it came into my possession I have reason for not revealing. Yet the story he had always maintained was that it was found by his stepdaughter. So why would he have reason for not revealing how he came by the object?